Now I'm going to introduce Tim Tetzloff, who's uh, from the Naples Zoo. He's the director of conservation there, and his job there focuses on saving animals in the wild through 20 long-term conservation projects. And he hosts annual African safaris, one of which is coming up, he said, in about six weeks, and they're on their way to Tanzania. In the past, his work at the Naples Zoo has allowed him to care for animals all the way from anteaters down to zebras. He's also worked at the Cedar Point theme park in Ohio, where he's presented educational talks to over a million guests. And his other conservation efforts include being president of the Florida Association of Zoos and Aquariums, chair of the Madagascar Flora and Fauna Group. He's a board member of the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, and he's a committee member in various conservation efforts. So, Tim, it's all yours. So back in the 1930s, telling stories, uh, family stories here, uh, my father got a job doing stunt work for uh, Tarzan Finds a Son, uh, one of the famous and the third of the, uh, pardon me, uh, one of the famous Tarzan films with Weiss Miller. So doing stunt work, one of the scenes in the film requires the stunt man to climb up this uh, log that's overhanging a grotto with the water in it, do a dive. The stunt man is going to take the first dive uh, for focus, and then Weiss Miller himself will make the dive for the film. And so my father goes walking up, uh, crawling up this, uh, this angled tree, and he looks down into the grotto, and all he sees are the two boats that are down there with the cameras. And as he measures his dive, it looks like he's going to put his head right into the bottom of one of those boats. And at that moment, he's trying to talk himself into doing the stunt, but can't get it out of his head. This is basically committing suicide. Uh, so he, knowing full well the crew is going to give him some razzing and some difficulty, uh, he climbs back down. Uh, Weiss Miller kind of walks past him, climbs up, gets to the top, makes the dive. Obviously, since we have this film, he did not die, didn't put his head through that boat. Uh, and Weiss Miller could have left it right there, could have, uh, could have just ignored my father could have gone up to him and given him grief that, you know, he had to go and dry off and get all ready to do the shot again and, you know, complain about stuntmen not being able to do their work. Uh, but that's not what he did. Weissmuller went out of his way to find my father later in the day and said, when I got to the top, I realized exactly why you came down. And the reason why he made that jump and my father did not is one of the lessons we'll talk about coming up. So the talk today focuses uh, on our conservation history and ways that you can grow a conservation ethic, find your passion uh, in a history that goes from Tarzan uh, with my father to me in uh, some of the work we do around Tarangiri National Park in Tanzania. So fast forward from the 1930s to today, Naples Zoo is involved in 25 plus regional and international efforts around the world uh, involved in saving plants and animals in the wild. We have participation programs where our guests here that come locally to Naples Zoo can make changes uh, in the things they buy, how they handle trash, the food they eat, uh, and how they drive uh, that can all make really important differences for wildlife. Uh, the zoo itself, we have population programs where we have breeding programs for rare endangered animals uh, involved in some significant efforts there. Uh, and then, of course, green programs that everybody who drives by on Good Old Road is very familiar with our solar panels, uh, but also some other efforts we make uh, that uh, try to be more friendly to the earth. So our goal here is long-term partnering. So basically, we're find people that are worth partnering with, and then we stay them, uh, stay with them until they either fix the problem or they're the wrong partner to have, uh, which means they did something wrong. And luckily we've had good success. Uh, and one of the things that's important is all of our conservation programs involve both people and wildlife. So currently, this is not all of them, uh, we fully fund the annual salary of 16 staff in seven different countries, including two wildlife veterinarians. 
And just to put it in raw dollars, uh, since 2014, we've invested over two and a half million dollars to sell, uh, save plants and animals in the wild. So how do you start going from one person being a stuntman on a Tarzan film to a history like this and the conservation impact? So this is mom and dad, uh, for those of you who have been around Naples area a while uh, and may even still refer to Naples Zoo as jungle areas. Uh, this was, these were my parents and their involvement here began in 1969. But my father's involvement with wildlife began when he was a young boy. While others were, uh, his childhood friends were the kind that would chop snakes in half, he was picking them up. And so my first question uh, about trying to find your passion, so you might already have it. You already have that passion. Uh, if you've never thought about it in those terms, basically it's what you fill your free time with, you're thinking about it. Uh, when a topic comes up, your friends immediately associate you with it. Um, and one of the things that's very important is the trying to go out and follow your passion. You can't always wait for the right time. Uh, right now in the middle of a global pandemic, it's obviously not the right time to do a lot of things. Uh, but my father was up against uh, the Great Depression in the 1930s when he was starting his career. And he opened up a reptilium in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, and that helped him pay for college and got him introduced to a lot of different people around the world. Um, so if you have not yet found your passion, so here's the boat. When the boat's not moving, it's really hard to steer. But once you start moving, uh, it's a lot easier to steer. So one of the things to follow, uh, find that passion is to start doing something, anything. Uh, you might find the thing you thought you were passionate about, you're not interested at all once you find out more about it, or you might latch on and say, this is exactly what I want. But once you get moving, you'll find more direction once you start doing that. And if you're one of the people who says, oh, that's actually not what I want to end up doing, you might be like Luke Dollar, uh, my friend here for the last couple of decades, uh, that's Luke on uh, the left with a lemur. Uh, when he was at Duke University, he thought he was going to be a primatologist, uh, went to Madagascar. Uh, long story short, uh, the creature on the right uh, that he's holding, the FUSA, is uh, about half their diet as lemurs. And as he put it, uh, the FUSA ate his homework. And so he became fascinated by this creature, and now he is one of the leading experts in the world on FUSA. So passions can change, uh, opportunities can arise. Uh, same way, uh, my friend, Dr. Amy Dickman, um, she began down in uh, the Serengeti with cheetahs. Uh, this is her on a notable birthday, having uh, uh, some champagne in the Serengeti. And she thought this is, this is what it's all about. It's something she wanted to do since she was a little girl. Uh, she has diary entries about what she's gonna do growing up, uh, but, passions and opportunities changed and she moved to work with lions down in Ruaha National Park, which has abundant tsetse flies. Most people have never heard of Ruaha National Park versus Serengeti, which is globally known. Uh, at the time, no fancy lodges, you know, no cold champagne on a regular basis, but her work there enabled her to achieve a 80% decline in carnivore killing, has saved tremendous numbers of lions down there by making that change. And then my mother, who was well on her way uh, to beginning a career uh, in the business world, met my father and went on a completely different adventure. So being willing to uh, be open to change is an important thing. Uh, and in fact, in the forward to her book, uh, Jaguar in the Kitchen, uh, it was written about her that she's a woman who learned to lead, who challenged the status quo, and who ultimately excelled in a world with few women role models. The industry, meaning zookeeping, has evolved in many ways, one of the most impressive being the increase in women zookeepers. I have no doubt that Nancy played an important role in birthing this new era. That was Jack Hanna in the forward. So the difference made there for the careers of a lot of women uh, and the important improvements in the zookeeping field with so many women involved, uh, I'm grateful to say I have some history there with my mother. So moving on from you find your passion, something that gets into your blood. So What's the way to move forward? So what's a problem uh, in your area of interest? Um, what can you figure that out? How can you figure that out and contribute? Uh, literature review is one thing if you're on the college uh, uh, track, uh, but 
one of the things my father did when he was in college is he wrote a paper on how to transition imported snakes to eat domestic food. Uh, so that's a picture, uh, picture of the famous uh, Frank Bring Him Back Alive Buck, a uh, wild animal collector in the early 20th century with a uh, python with a very large pig inside it. Uh, these snakes did not really uh, take to domestic food very well. My father figured out how to do that. Uh, and Frank Buck ended up getting a, uh, offering my father a job. Uh, so again, being open to changing plans. This was in the depression. He was already in college and I don't know the name of the professor, but I'm so grateful. He gave my father some very good advice, uh, that when somebody like Frank Buck knocks on your door, they probably only do it once, but there will always be universities. So off he went to New York city to work at the, uh, the very famous 1939 world's fair, uh, where he got even more experience. So putting yourself in a place to be lucky, be willing to make that uh, step, pretty bold step uh, to go out there and get that experience uh, when the opportunities open up. Also put yourself in a place to be lucky. Uh, this is a very good friend of mine. Uh, and just having a valid passport gives you opportunities. Uh, she was working at another zoo uh, that was doing some work with rhinos. Uh, and because she had that passport ready to go, she was more able to be selected uh, and even got a wonderful experience as they were flying back to see the pyramids uh, from the air up in the cockpit. Things you can do on a cargo plane that you can't do in regular commercial airlines. Um, and so returning to the story about my father and Tarzan, being willing to try new things. So working um, with animals and then also trying to do stunt work, which is what he got hired on to do, working with the animals and doing some other things on the set uh, is how he got to work with Weiss Miller. Um, and the other ideas don't always go for the glory. Uh, again, on the college track, run statistics, proof papers for researchers whose first language is in English. Uh, I've done that multiple times. It's very helpful for folks. My father worked as an uncredited stuntman, uh, and that was obviously not one of those things you get glory for. So the reason that Johnny Weissmiller was able to take that dive when my father was not able to take that dive is, uh, is what my father found out when Johnny Weissmiller came and found my father after his unsuccessful dive and Weissmiller's two successful dives. He came up and he said, I, I, I got up to the top of that, that log and immediately I, I saw you thought you were gonna jump right into one of those boats. Uh, and he said, if I were you, I would have done the same thing. I wouldn't want to have taken that chance, but I've worked with this crew for long enough and they don't make mistakes like that. So these people had his back uh, and he had theirs uh, to trust them. And that made all the difference. And we have a wonderful film because of that. And then plans can run into lots of hiccups. Uh, so be resilient during unwanted change. So he was well on his way uh, working with wildlife. Uh, I love the expression on that woman's face as he's milking the rattlesnake. Um, so he was doing, uh, Milking, uh, milking snakes, working uh, in the animal field, uh, did a number of milkings uh, for a pharmaceutical company uh, during the war uh, to get the anti venine for the troops in the South Pacific. Um, but the animal path took a detour. Uh, couldn't make a living during the war doing that. So he did some freelance work up at McDill uh, as a hot papa. Those are the guys that put the uh, asbestos suits on and run and grab the pilots out of uh, burning planes uh, and then ended up even managing a drugstore uh, up in Michigan uh, when things uh, just couldn't work out with the animals. But staying resilient, keeping that passion, uh, and then he eventually went off on his own, uh, pushing well out of his comfort zone. He loved animals, uh, but to do this, he had to then become an accountant, an advertising person, doing all the bookings, the travel, everything to coordinate this to return to his love of wildlife and educating people uh, about animals. Eventually opened up a smaller uh, animal attraction at a small theme park in Ohio uh, and continued doing these wildlife presentations in the area uh, around multiple states, uh, including one back in the 1960s, uh, much later, uh, skipping ahead a little bit there, uh, the Vanishing Everglades program he did uh, with my mother in the 1960s. Um, and then along the lines of finding uh, those people who have your back, it's like-minded colleagues. Find, find friends that 
want to do the same things you do in the field. Uh, and those are, those are wonderful folks to keep you going when times are rough. Uh, this was Captain Penny, uh, Ron Penn found. He was a uh, uh, children's television star in the uh, regional Cleveland area. Uh, they became best friends. Uh, Ron was actually best man at my father's wedding. Uh, they had a lot of fun together and uh, uh, entertained a lot of kids and introduced a lot of them to the world of wildlife. Um, and then obviously one of the best colleagues you can have in your life is a spouse. This is the first day my mother and father met. Um, that's a boa constrictor around her neck. Um, there were two photographs taken that day. The first one my mother torn up, uh, tore up because she was screaming, uh, but she got used to the snake uh, pretty quick and uh, things uh, actually worked out really well. Uh, they got married and she rapidly overcome, overcame all her fear of snakes. Uh, you can see there were some pythons in various shots there. So another point here is be willing to say yes and then figure it out. Um, so the sign on the left there, for those of you who've been in Naples uh, for uh, over uh, 15, 16 years, may remember the big sign up on US 41 uh, would be Coastland Center behind that uh, these days. Um, when they came down in 1969 and had an opportunity to lease the land here, uh, there were a whole lot of questions, but they realized this was an opportunity that they couldn't pass up. And so they said yes, and then figured it out. And one of the parts of figuring it out and finding those people to work with you and attracting those like-minded colleagues uh, is telling stories, your stories and the stories you're passionate about. And this is one of my favorite quotes. There's some question about the uh, authenticity of the quote, but I love the quote itself. Uh, it says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men and women to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Uh, in other words, you're transferring your passion. Uh, instead of giving the orders and, and making it a job, uh, engender that idea of that vast end of the sea and then you get a whole cadre of people who want to know how to build the ship to go enjoy that and go explore it and again uh one of the best things you can do is not just work with but how can you help those other uh friends that you're working with one of my uh, friends is retired biologist larry richardson for the panther refuge um uh, naples zoo helped fund uh one of the early camera trap and image analysis programs uh, out on the refuge with a large camera grid uh, back in 2011. Um, continue to work with the refuge. Uh, the graphics that you see out there on the trailhead today were, were ones that I uh, redid for uh, the refuge. And so appreciate continuing to have an opportunity to help, uh, help my friends at the refuge. Uh, do the same thing for the wonderful folks down at, Fort, uh, pardon me, at the Big Cypress uh, National Preserve involving uh, people and wildlife, keeping them both safe around each other. Um, another project I did with Big Cypress was a wonderful video, uh, award-winning video. Uh, these are only about half the film festivals that's been seen out. Uh, the Return of the Panther, which you can see at pantherlands.org. Um, and it's a wonderful video uh, that talks about the Florida Panther and some of the partners that we need in protecting that animal. Uh, other relationships that take time to build, uh, the picture on the far right there, uh, my friend Albert over in Tanzania, uh, he and I have known each other over 10 years now. Uh, so it began with seeing each other on safari and then introductions to rhino rangers, getting to know their needs more. Uh, and so we've done everything from fundraising for uh, one and two man tents they need while they're monitoring the rhinos out in the field. Uh, to a project that was originally going to be about $180,000 with these uh, powerful binocular telescopes. Um, and now uh, we've gotten all that funded uh, and those rhino rangers are better, better able to do their work. Uh, and that's Dr. Freddie Mananji there in the suit, uh, who is the head of the CAA, uh, Ngorongoro Conservation Area Authority. Nothing to do with uh, college sports. <laughs> um, then I love this one. It's making unnecessary friends. Uh, so you just never know who, who your connections are going to be, what they might lead to. Uh, so finding people in and outside your field, uh, uh, 
uh, to be friends with is a wonderful thing. Uh, so the gentleman in the back uh, was kind of uh, long for the ride that day. I was bringing my friend Arno Debier, who is in the brown shirt, uh, a colleague of mine from Brazil, uh, along with Larry Richardson out in the Panther Refuge. And while we spent time out there that day, that's David Schindel, who was currently, uh, he was then at the Conservancy of Southwest Florida. Uh, and he moved into a position with the Fish and Wildlife Service where he's the Florida Panther Coordinator uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and just that day out there uh, began a long-term relationship and connections and all that built to where we were able to partner with both uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission to create a temporary care facility uh, for orphaned and injured panthers. Uh, in fact, we just uh, had one in here this past week uh, that uh, got separated from mom and that FWC was able to reunite. Uh, and so we provide that all uh, those resources come from uh, the zoo community, uh, from Naples Zoo that is. Uh, we do that at no charge to the service uh, or to FWC, just helping them out however we can for this endangered cat. Uh, and because of that, uh, we appreciate statements uh, like uh, David Schindel said about our uh, support for uh, panthers in the wild. And for those of you who don't know, that is a young panther kitten. They are spotted when they are young, with those beautiful eyes. Uh, more unnecessary friends. Uh, the gentleman on the far left, uh, Dr. Luke Hunter, uh, connected with him in the 1990s on a Florida panther, uh, actually on a puma question. Uh, and that relationship uh, just continued to grow over the years and so had the opportunity to work more closely with him when it came to some cattle study in Colombia that had implications for cattle and Florida Panther. Uh, and eventually that led to us bringing in uh, Raramuri Criollo cattle uh, and on the ranch of a former FWC commissioner uh, to explore uh, whether this uh, particular breed of cattle might be helpful in protecting uh, calves from predatory panthers. Uh, so partner wherever you can. Um, um, happy to partner with ranchers, uh, with people who are interested in obviously maintaining their economics. Uh, this is a, a rancher who has almost 10,000 acres, Dr. Lisa Pretty, uh, not doctor, uh, Lisa Pretty. Um, and uh, she's got, you know, thousands of acres. Well, I don't have thousands of acres. Zuzu doesn't have thousands of acres, uh, but she does. So that's a wonderful partner to have to test some of these things to see how we can help both the landowners and the Panthers uh, live together. And then looking for opportunities anywhere. Um, so sometimes they're as close as your next door neighbor. Uh, this is uh, uh, Ian Bartizik, uh, delighted to work with him. They're doing phenomenal work uh, next door. Uh, on uh, research and removal efforts with the invasive Burmese python. Uh, and so uh, I'm actually uh, kind of going to be talking to him in about an hour. Uh, so finding ways to work together uh, and do even more uh, through that collaboration. Um, and then building on a foundation, use whatever you have. Uh, you know, I have my experience uh, growing up in this field being surrounded by animals, uh, being able to travel to Africa, uh, using those opportunities to build on each other. So seeing whatever you have in your background uh, and see how it goes. Now, one of the things that got me started in Madagascar had nothing to do with animals per se, but I have some graphic design uh, background. And so I saw the original Madagascar Fauna Group uh, website and I said, well, I can do a little bit better than that. And in the 1990s, that was what it looked like, uh, early 2000s. Uh, so I redid their website, uh, ended up doing over a dozen different websites to help out on different conservation projects. Also helping out with graphic design for different efforts. Uh, and so uh, anybody who has dogs, uh, they can learn how to keep your pets safe around cane toads uh, through this informational poster the zoo has uh, that we also get out to veterinary clinics, a uh, variety of other things to help people understand the best ways to live around wildlife. And then seeing how you can use those resources to help others. Uh, obviously, uh, we've got a lot of natural partners in the area, uh, both uh, non-government organizations as well as government organizations. And we have different efforts here, like the Florida Panther Festival in November or Boo at the Zoo, that we bring in some of these partners so they can meet the guests that we have and meet thousands of people in a single day. 
Another very important thing as far as developing that passion and moving forward is, uh, is showing up. Uh, find a way to get in the room, uh, whether it's conferences, uh, attending uh, even things like we're doing right now, uh, open sessions, open talks, and find ways to interact with those folks, uh, ask questions, and see how you can potentially help. Um, those are just some of the ways you can get started uh, and by looking for some of those gaps to fill. These are some of the organizations I ended up getting involved with. And so a lot of those were just getting to learn about the organization, seeing what could happen, and then looking for an opportunity uh, where there was a need that could be met. And then sometimes it can pay off real nicely. Uh, in conservation, uh, a lot of these programs are in wonderful places where these animals are, and that lets me travel into some of the, the really wonderful parts of uh, this world. And then uh, very important is creating real relationships and asking where those needs are. So this is a recreated moment from many years ago uh, with Luke Hunter, uh, pardon me, Luke Dollar, um, when uh, he was doing a talk at an Association of Zoos and Aquariums conference uh, about FUSA. Uh, and I was obviously interested in Madagascar. And so I was one of a couple hundred people in the room, but found a way to meet him, uh, begin a conversation uh, and see how I could come alongside and help in any way possible. And that blossomed into a wonderful friendship. Uh, Luke's an amazing guy. Uh, he's been to my house, I've been to his, I've traveled to Madagascar with him. He comes every year to Naples uh, and he goes to see, uh, uh, he's actually been to every elementary school in Collier County, uh, meeting with fourth graders. So it's a wonderful thing to bring uh, a National Geographic Explorer into the classroom. Uh, for me, it'd be like Jacques Cousteau walking in the room when I was a kid or Jim Fowler. Uh, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to inspire uh, young minds. Uh, this is me at his camp in northeast Madagascar, uh, northwest Madagascar, uh, at Carafonsica National Park. Uh, and this was an anesthetized FUSA uh, that uh, uh, was uh, some research was being done on. And again, wonderful statements from somebody like Luke. Uh, and that we have funded more collaring and satellite-based tracking of FUSAs than any other organization on Earth, uh, came out of finding a way to come alongside and help somebody that was doing something that you, you value. Uh, and another one of his passions is educating the children in Madagascar and uh, uh, through a significant donation that actually came from my mother, uh, we have a new school uh, just outside the national park there for uh, the kids. And we have four of those 16 staff that we fund are in Madagascar with Luke. And then one thing always leads to another when you keep on asking questions. It was over at dinner uh, that Luke and I actually had uh, down at Bayfront, uh, came in late for an evening uh, before he was meeting with the schools the next day. And we sat down for dinner and he was doing work for that time with National Geographic's uh, Big Cats Initiative and said, you wanna hear about the program that's got the best bang for the buck I've seen? I said, absolutely. Uh, and that led to Lely Lichtenfeld um, and an amazing program building living walls to protect animals, the livestock uh, from predators like hyenas and lions, uh, near 100% success rate of protecting animals in these corrals, uh, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and I've had the chance to visit some of those communities. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing when friends continue to help friends. Um, and again, you just never know where the connections are going to leave. Uh, just answering one email about another zoo colleague who wanted a translation of something into Madaga Malagasy, uh, the language in Madagascar. Um, I was just like, well, I don't know Malagasy, but I know someone who regularly travels to Madagascar, and that was Connie Bransilver. Uh, she directed me to Eva Sargent. That led to Andrea and Charlie, who actually lived in Madagascar and ran the Madagascar Fauna and Flora group for 14 years. Um, and then that led me to all these other people over the years, uh, including our current uh, executive director. And in 2018, I was uh, elected chair of the MFG. Um, so sometimes you just don't know where what thing is going to lead to uh but that opportunity to to help somebody usually can lead to very good things and this was a wonderful moment uh 
the, the school in Madagascar that's at Parque Villaline that does the Saturday school program, which is an amazing program. Uh, their thatch roof would just leak like a sieve. Uh, and so they needed a metal roof. We fundraised for it here at the zoo. And then uh, a number of years later, I got to actually stand under that roof. And so there's wonderful opportunities to, to help other people. And uh, with that kind of attitude, it generally pays off. And sometimes you can get fun opportunities to meet some of your, uh, your personal favorites. Uh, got a chance through uh, working with Madagascar to meet John Cleese. Uh, he did a, a documentary with PBS on our programs in Madagascar with uh, releasing black and white rough believers. And then again, using those gifts and connections and resources to help, um, done a variety of things uh, with this project, the Giant Armadillo Conservation Program. Uh, the gentleman uh, on the far uh, left on the top photo or in the black shirt on the bottom left, uh, that's Daniel Kluber. He's a wildlife veterinarian. We fully fund his annual salary. The person immediately next to him in both those pictures is Arnaud Devier uh, that you uh, saw in the Panther Refuge uh, swamp buggy earlier. Uh, we uh, arranged for them to get uh, funding for a vet scan, which enables them to do blood chemistry analysis and it opens a lot of doors for research and to help those animals down in Brazil. Um, so these are amazing creatures. We actually have a lecture coming up on April 1st, that's this Friday, uh, that uh, Arno Debye will be talking about some of their amazing work with not only the giant armadillos, uh, but also uh, anteaters and highways. Uh, again, there's Danilo Kluber doing some of his important veterinary work. And uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, wonderful videos of uh, the giant armadillo and her, uh, her baby. Uh, which they wonderfully named Tim after me. I was delighted with that. But these animals are incredible. Uh, they can be up to five feet long and weigh over 100 pounds. Far cry from uh, the little armadillos we have around here. And then another idea uh, that I like to share always is just be curious. I was in a colleague's office and I saw uh, what looked like a sculpture or a casting and I was just like, where did this come from? Uh, and found out it was a friend of that person's that had actually uh, been to the zoo and did a casting of one of our alligator's feet when it was under anesthesia. Um, and that led to me meeting her, uh, inviting her to connect with the Giant Armadillo Conservation Program because they wanted some biofacts made of this animal to help better inform people. This is an animal that's rarely seen. Uh, and so they can see things like those eight inch claws that these animals have. Uh, and she ended up actually going down into the Pantanal in Brazil and doing those castings uh, directly herself. Amazing, uh, amazing animals. And those friends then in turn end up helping the zoo. These are wonderful folks uh, that have come from all over the world to do their presentations here at our conservation lecture series. Um, and there's uh, Dr. Uh, Luke Hunter again. Uh, he oversees big cat conservation in about 25 countries for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, so wonderful to be able to work with people doing these things. And then again, uh, I know this is a little bit repetitive, but I just can't emphasize enough. Uh, don't go in looking for something for yourself. Go in with an attitude of service, asking where those needs are. Uh, when I sat down with the head of uh, Giraffe Conservation Foundation, Julian and Steph Fennessy, uh, and basically said, where, where are the needs? And they said, basically, Sarah. Um, they were doing desnaring work, and Dr. Sarah Ferguson was rescuing giraffe from these horrible wounds that would get inflicted by wire snares. Uh, she's rescued uh, over 260 of these animals. Uh, they get caught in these snares. This is one where the snare was attached to a smaller uh, bush uh, and was not uh, not secure enough in the ground that the giraffe was not trapped there, but just pulled that awful, awful thing to see. Uh, wonderfully, Sarah rescued that giraffe. And so there's lots of good opportunities to make differences for wildlife when you have things like, uh, things like that rescuing can happen. So these snares can be debilitating. Uh, the poor giraffe on the right is a tripod. Uh, and you can see the snare almost cut entirely through uh, the foot of the giraffe on the left. Uh, and so that's Dr. Ferguson, amazing, amazing person. 
uh, like I said, in a little over two years, rescued uh, over 250 of these animals. She's currently the Giraffe Conservation Health Coordinator for Giraffe Conservation Foundation. So it was very critical for her to remain in the program. They didn't currently have funding for her. And so it required about a doubling of support uh, from what we had been doing for giraffe conservation. But I realized the importance of it. And so we sorted it out and made it work. She's also rescued other snared animals. This, uh, I first thought this, pardon the graphic nature of these uh, photographs. I at first thought this lion had died. Um, that was a snare wound, but uh, in fact, uh, her name is Florence. She survived that wound and she's out there alive in Murchison Falls today. So rescuing these animals is absolutely critical because that would have certainly killed that animal uh, had she not been rescued. Uh, and this is a quick look at one of those desnarings, a uh, young, uh, young female giraffe that had a, a snare that was very recent. And so we were able to rescue her. Uh, and we've not only, it's not only me that's been there, we've actually had uh, three other staff who have been over to uh, Africa to help in this work in Uganda, uh, as well as some other work in Namibia. Um, other folks we've helped out, Caio uh, uh, Praches is a biologist with the Blue Fronted Amazon Project. Uh, wonderful effort to work on the trafficking where 90% of these uh, rare birds are getting uh, killed in the process. Uh, Glossia Sages began that program. And so again, this came from working with uh, friends at Park Saves, saying, where's the greatest need? And they said, this is the one nobody's paying attention to uh, because it's not a critically endangered species, but it is the most trafficked and it's gonna get there. So we decided to get ahead of it. Um, and then be open to ideas from anywhere, anytime. Uh, I was placing a print order uh, with this company called Jack Prints. And at the end of it, it said, you just planted a tree uh, with my order. And I was just like, what? So I had to learn more about that. Uh, and so I looked into it. Uh, it was an NGO, non-governmental non organization called Trees for the Future. Had to look into it. They do amazing work. Uh, this is the difference of about three years between those two photographs. Uh, within about four years, they can quadruple a family's income, forever changes uh, a family. And so uh, this is the CEO of that organization. Uh, when he was down here speaking not only to our board, but also at the lecture series and absolutely amazing uh, differences uh, this happens to make when they do this work. So to date, we've uh, planted uh, through trees for the future over 870,000 trees, hoping to get that to a million as soon as we can. Uh, and we ended up sur surpassing Jack Prince, the company that I originally found out about this from. Uh, so very grateful to Jack Prince for introducing me to them and very grateful we were able to make such a difference uh, in helping families around the world. Um, and finally, once you find that passion and once you start working on it, don't lose touch with it. Um, I began working directly with animals, uh, as we mentioned in the, the opening, to work with animals from anteaters to zebras. Uh, but the more I get involved, sometimes the more I'm behind a computer and a desk. So find ways to get out there uh, and be in the thing or involved directly with the thing where your passion still is. Uh, I have a great opportunity to make changes because of the job I have now, uh, but still finding a way to get back in touch with the wildlife is important. And then share what you have with others, all the things you've learned, pass those on, bring other people into that circle. Uh, if you travel, take them with you. If people come to town, introduce them. Uh, just find ways to incorporate uh, other people into into having the experiences that you've built having. And then this is for everybody, uh, fight the algorithms to achieve your goals. There are all these different programs and I should add TikTok in there now. Uh, they're wonderful resources to have, but their goal is to sell advertising, not to inform you. So they're not like books. Uh, so use them for what they are, but just remember uh, to pay attention to the things you really want to do. Final couple thoughts here. Read well before your time for inspiration. This is absolutely one of my favorite quotes in life. William Beebe, who was an amazing uh, explorer, said, the beauty and genius of a work of art may be reconceived, though its first material expression be destroyed. A vanished harmony may yet again inspire the composer, but when the last individual of a race of living things breathes no more, another heaven and another earth must pass before such a one can be again. Uh, such an eloquent way to describe the loss of extinction. And another very well-known uh, 
a leader in the environmental movement, Aldo Leopold, uh, put his take on biodiversity this way, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. If you take something apart, don't keep the parts, it's not gonna go back together again. Um, and then reading from and about other cultures, so important. Uh, you know, for example, Serengeti, as we know it most of the time, is this pristine wilderness that just was had a line drawn around it and protected. It was a much more complex story than that, uh, involving a whole lot of things. Uh, and so reading from different perspectives in Tanzania, uh, West Germany had a huge influence there, and all of that came together um, to make Serengeti what it is. And it is amazing and problematic at the same time. So these are our examples. So what will yours be? Uh, love this simple quote from a poem. Tell me what it is that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. Um, and then when it comes to all those different things you're, you're putting together, the people you're meeting with, uh, it's great to think differently. And that's why meeting people from different fields is so important uh, to have them in your circle of uh, awareness uh, because over 100 years ago, the founder of the garden said it's high time to protect and preserve what's still left in Florida. He'd be pretty heartbroken to see how much prairie has been turned into pavement. Uh, so we've done a lot of good things in the 20th century to move forward in conservation, but it hasn't been enough. The old ways just aren't working. Um, and along the way, make sure to keep laughing at yourself. Uh, this was, I asked somebody to take my picture um, in the days before selfies. Uh, when I was over at Lake Manyara um, and just had some baboons in the background, said, take my picture real quick. Didn't realize they had lined my head up to look like I was a chia pet. Uh, initially disappointed, and then I looked at it and was like, well, that's just too funny. So that's been an ongoing thing. I repeated that same photograph uh, on future visits to that same place. Um, so keep laughing at yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. And even better, uh, keep that laughter going with friends. That's my father and his best friend, and that's me and Luke uh, Dollar having a great time visiting those schools. So hopefully that is some of the fun you guys can have um, with figuring out how to identify your passion, uh, go further with it, uh, and then uh, hopefully keep going with it and sharing it with others. If you are enjoying watching this on YouTube, Please like and subscribe for more. Those snares are put out by uh, local Ugandans and sometimes uh, people from DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, come up the Nile River to plant those. They're usually going after smaller prey, uh, like antelope, uh, but if they get a giraffe, they, they, will, uh, they will kill and eat it. Um, if they go directly after giraffe, they typically put the snares high up in the trees, uh, so they're actually caught by the neck. Uh, but it is a mix of subsistence, people who want the protein for themselves, and also those who are selling it in the markets. Okay, so there are some poachers there too, or this is just... Yeah, that's all 100% poaching, yeah. But thank you for your time, and I appreciate all your uh, conservation efforts. Asante sana. I think that's how we say it in Swahili, right? Indeed it is. Okay, so have a good day. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.